In the early 1600s, basic microscopes were in use throughout Europe. Gentlemen scientists were held spellbound by their ability to enlarge the universe of the very small. Then in 1665, an English scientist named Robert Hooke observed the tiny boxes in a sliver of cork and called them cells because they reminded him of the small rooms lived in by monks. Hooke's observation set the stage for our first great discovery. Anton van Leeuwenhoek was a Dutch merchant fascinated with science. Upon learning about Hooke's microscope, he decided to build one for himself. Dr. Gall. To find out what happened next, I paid a visit to Joseph Gall, a cell biologist at the Carnegie Institution in Baltimore, Maryland. Antoine Leeuwenhoek, what did he discover? Well, Leeuwenhoek discovered quite a few things, but what he's most famous for are discovering protozoa, that is, small, single-celled animals that live in pond water. How did he do that? He did it using a microscope of his own construction. And would you like to see? Oh, her? yes. So, you have a Leeuwenhoek microscope? Well, not an original. I have a replica of a Leeuwenhoek microscope. It consists of uh, two brass plates with a small a piece of glass, which is the lens. And the way you use this is to put the specimen on the pin here, and then you hold your eye up very close to the lens on this side. And when you do that, you can see the point of the uh, pin. And you can put the specimen, whether it's an insect or whatever, on that uh, pin. Uh, would you like to take a look at it? Oh, yeah. It's kind of heavy because it's brass. Well, it's brass. Yeah. He made them... In 1675, brass. Van Leeuwenhoek was using his microscope to examine a bead of water when he observed something extraordinary, a world filled with creatures that no human had ever seen, microorganisms. So with this, with all due respect, primitive gizmo, yes. he discovered single-celled animals, things exactly. we, we take for granted yes. now. What he's most famous for are discovering protozoa, bacteria, and sperm. This thing is brilliant. It's got a mechanical stage, it's got a focusing device, uh, it's got all of the things that you need to uh, look at a specimen. And it works. <laughs> Did they know what they were seeing? Do you know what I mean? Like, did they understand? Well, I doubt that they really understood what they were seeing in the, in the modern sense, but they were impressed that uh, all these little things that were, were alive in water, I mean, people had no idea that water was teeming with uh, organisms. I guess I just had no idea the thing was this small and delicate, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and frankly, so elegant, because it's palm of your hand, and what you see on the tip of that pin changes the world. It does, indeed. It was an enlargement of our understanding of the nature, nature of the natural world, that, that the world out there was not just dead things, but that it, were, it was teeming with life. Our next great discovery occurred in 1831. English naturalist Robert Brown was studying the different types of plant species he'd collected during a voyage to Australia. Brown had an exquisite eye for detail. The cells of the plants were of particular interest to him. While examining them under his microscope, he saw something intriguing. In each cell, a similar structure, circular, opaque. He called it the nucleus. Upon learning of Brown's observations, German physiologist Theodor Schwann began looking for a similar structure in the cells of tadpoles, and he found it. Each and every cell of the tadpole had a nucleus as well. It was a revolutionary breakthrough. Here was evidence that all life was connected. In this book, Schwann 
describes various cell types from all sorts of organisms and identifies them by the fact that they have a nucleus in them. How would you say the discovery of the nucleus was a great discovery? The realization that there was a unit of structure to all organisms. This was a unit of structure not only in plants but in animals. So it united both the plant and the animal kingdoms into something that had uh, similarities uh, to each other. More than a century after the discovery of the cell nucleus, it was believed there were two fundamental types of life on Earth, bacteria and everything else. Bacteria were classified as prokaryotes. These were simple, single-celled organisms with their DNA contained not within a nucleus, but by the cell wall. All other life forms were classified as eukaryotes. Their cells carried their DNA enclosed within the nucleus. But this simple classification system was in for a shock. In 1977, biologist Carl Woese was studying the genetic makeup of a methane-producing microbe when he realized it was different from any known bacterium. Its cell wall was unique. It produced unusual enzymes. And its genetic sequence was unlike anything he'd ever seen. It became soon apparent within the, within the scope of the space of an hour that there was, there was something, a third thing out there. This was the moment of discovery. Carl Woese had found a third form of life a group of single-celled organisms that he called archaea. We used to think there were two primary kingdoms on this planet. Now we know there are three. That was the shift, big shift, because all of microbiology had been structured around the idea that all bacteria are fundamentally the same, not in their details, but in their essence, their ancestry and their basic cell organization. Here is something that every microbiologist and biologist firmly believed in, and it wasn't true. <laughs> so it does make you smile, doesn't it? Yeah, look what I found. <laughs> what he found was a life form able to live anywhere on the planet, including the most extreme environments. Some archaea even call this home, hydrothermal vents on the ocean floor. Temperatures here fluctuate wildly within just a few inches, going from freezing to a scorching 760 degrees Fahrenheit. Archaea have also been found living miles inside the earth, thriving in lakes of acid where even iron minerals dissolve. Today, some biologists believe that archaea are the common ancestor from which eukaryotes evolved and that includes you and me. For Carl Woese, the discovery of archaea remains a sweet memory. It was picked up when published by the New York Times first and the other newspapers and then the TV came in and, and I can remember walking outside of my house one night saying, when all this was happening, say, tonight the world belongs to you. <laughs> 